Hello and welcome once again to episode 39 of Code Completion. We are a group of iOS developers and educators hoping to share what we love most about development, Apple technology, and completing your code. My name is Dimitri and I'll be your host once again for this episode and I'm joined today by my fellow completionist, Spencer. Hey there. And Fernando. Hello, hello. So before we get into our main topic, it's time for our indie app spotlight. First up is SongKit by Thomas Grapperon an iPhone and iPad app that makes it easy to build song sheets. SongKit lets you display and edit songs for piano and guitar-like instruments through a wonderfully polished interface full of functionality. Behind the scenes, SongKit is built on an engine that uses musical intervals internally, so a song can be transposed perfectly. Not to mention, SongKit also uses a bit of AI smarts, so tab and chord voicings can be automatically transposed. If you are like me and know nothing about music, but like writing apps, a song kit is also an excellent source of inspiration when it comes to packing a ton of functionality in a very tasteful UI. Uh, so uh, if, if you like doing app development, I definitely recommend it as a point of inspiration uh, there when building your own UIs. Uh, song kit costs only $9.99 on the iOS app store, so please support Thomas by checking it out. Finally, we have Minimal by Arthur Van Sislin a meditation-inspired writing app for iPhone, iPad, Mac, and even Apple Watch. Minimal is a notepad designed to get out of your way so you can concentrate on what you want to write or note down. It supports collaboration, publishing notes as a simple and clean website, organizing notes into projects, and even some special functionality to keep your life uncluttered by automatically filing untouched notes away. Minimal is free to download and starts at $3.99 per month to unlock all its features, so please support Arthur by giving it a try. Are you an indie developer? We want to hear from you. Please reach out to us on Twitter at Code Completion via DM so we can spotlight your app in the future as well. So our main topic for today uh, is all about debugging and the different techniques that we use uh, to debug our code and to get a good grasp as to what the computer uh, is doing under the hood. Um, and I would say learning about debugging very early on uh, in your software career is actually super useful because it allows you to understand what your code does um, on a line by line basis. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Fernando, what do you, uh, how do you like to debug your own code? I don't. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I'm very, very uh, slow about debugging. Uh, Literally, number one issue is you got to reproduce the issue, like the bug. Doesn't matter what technique you want to use. If you cannot reproduce, uh, there's basically, you're just shooting, shooting in the dark. So the first thing I always, always do is like, if I have like a story or something, I just follow the, uh, follow the steps. Or if like, sometimes you're not as, not as lucky, like if you're not working with someone from QA, and just a random user says, hey, my 10th email is just disappearing, then you just try and kind of uh, reproduce it. Uh, from there on, it just becomes a battle of the minds, right? I really love this phrase, and I think everyone has heard it, about uh, you when you debug, it's like you're the detective, but you're also the killer. I'm, I'm, I'll find it in a second, but... I think that's the issue. You have to find, uh, you have to find a way of reading the code and then absorbing it again, building the algorithm in your head, and then start going from there. As for the specifics, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but uh, Dimitri has a list here. I don't know if you want to go through each of them, and we can discuss them. Or, yeah, you're not supposed to reveal the list, Fernando. <laughs> what? Wait, we can. This is live. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, you're up, Spencer. Save me. Okay, <laughs> senpai. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think really it will depend for me. At least, uh, kind of talking about my my day job, the app I work on, Luma Fusion. Um, it depends on probably where the bug is coming from, and so. For example, if I'm working on X feature and it's a feature that, you know, I've been sort of writing more or less and I just kind of have to hook it up, I should more or less know the code fairly well and be able to, um, like Fernando said, reproduce the bug, 
um, and then you know uh, probably just use some breakpoints and and figure out where things are happening. And, and I'll generally uh, I tend to use breakpoints and use the console just PO things as opposed to like printing or NS logging unless there's some sort of loop happening where that becomes perhaps a little cumbersome. Um, but other times I may be, you know, just grabbing a ticket that is in a completely separate part of the app that I don't know very well. And so um, I think a part of, you know, what um, figuring out how to reproduce the bug is also figuring out where in the general area of the app uh, something would even be run. And so there are so many files that we have in our app that oftentimes if it's something related to, uh, I don't know, some, maybe it's in some uh, toolbar or something. Generally what I'll do is, because I, I literally don't know the, the name of the class that that toolbar exists under, Yeah, I'll yep. go into like the view debugger, click on that, figure out what the, you know, the class of the view is. And, and then from there kind of do the same thing, pull out some breakpoints uh, and, and figure out where, you know, where things are going wrong. Um, of course, if you're getting crashes and it's not just like this kind of random bug, the, the console again is great because it will uh, give you hopefully some sort of error message that can more or less lead you on the right track, whether that's uh, some internal error message, or maybe you've been uh, writing error messages along the way. I, I guess that kind of depends on on everyone's app, of course. Yeah. Be before we move on from from that example, I really like that you mentioned the view debugger. Um, I think it's really really powerful that you have an entry point into the code base that's not just random. Because um, one thing I've I've always tell uh, like basically anyone that will listen is that. When you join a work, like a job, an actual job as a developer, you'll join a code base that's probably massive. Usually it's huge. And there's just no way that you're going to get comfortable with it for like probably months. Um, and so if there is a bug that you need to fix, because debugging is actually really good to uh, getting familiar with a code base because you have to like understand the code, uh, going through the UI is really, really powerful. And, and it's amazing that Apple offers the view debugger. So it's like when, like, even if it happens uh, way after the whatever UI element was pressed or triggered or displayed, uh, you at least have a starting point. And from there on, you're like, okay, what is this button doing? Why are we displaying this label? And then you start backtracking. So, I, yeah, I really, yep. really like that. And the view debugger was actually imp inspired by another app that came out a bit before it called Reveal, um, which... Uh, did exactly that. It provided a, a little library that you can include with your app. And then inside of the reveal app, you can go ahead and see all the views um, inside of a 3D space that you can kind of play around with. So um, I'm really glad that Apple added that feature to Xcode directly because it is super useful um, along with like the memory debugger as well to kind of see what yep. objects are floating around at one, any given point. Um, those are some really useful tools to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, now, sometimes, I, like as you mentioned, Fernando, it's really useful to be able to reproduce a bug, but sometimes you can't reproduce a bug. So all you yeah. are kind of left with um, is just shooting in the dark. But something that a debugger provides that just like printing out variables may not um, is you can go ahead and slow down the computer to your own thought process and follow it along with what it's doing um, and that might provide some hints as far as why something might be going wrong, because it's very rarely that a bug occurs and you have no clue like what's going on. You know, at least it's part of a certain part of the app. Um, it's it's it within that area. Um, so you have some things that you can go off of and sometimes just following along with what the code is actually doing and comparing it to what you think it should be doing mm -hmm. um, is a useful technique to um, really see like what is going wrong and what is the code doing differently. Um, one thing that Swift actually drives me nuts with is if you try to do this with Swift, half the time, I would say like one time out of 10, uh, Xcode will just go ahead and say, oh, uh, you meant to skip to the next line, but let's just continue the program and stop stop your debugging session. And that drives me nuts. Have either it's of you run into that? 
Yeah, I was going to say there's. I found a quote. Uh, this this is a good um, segue. I found a quote that says debugging is like being the detective in a crime movie where you are also the murderer. And to add to your point, Dimitri, I think it's more like a uh, cop comedy where you're the competent cop and Xcode is the wild card. Sometimes they're there to help you out, catch the bad guys. And sometimes they're just like tripping over themselves, shooting at you. And you're like, what are you doing? We need to get to this place. And they're like, ah, I'm so drunk. And it just like does whatever it does. Like the console, Spencer was saying about like uh, using the console and things like that. And I think that's super useful. I always, maybe it's like Lucy and the football, but I, I always open like the helper window of the console where you can see like the variables. And mm -hmm. to me personally, it just feels like 90% of the time, it's useless. It's like, oh, there's no description. Oh, no, I can't print that right now. And I'm like, ah, it's just frustrating. Uh, so, yeah, it's very annoying sometimes. It can get frustrating. Yeah, there's, there's actually commands that works in all those situations, especially when uh, the debugger has no idea what Swift is as a language anymore. Uh, and that is V. <laughs> Um, so instead of doing P, your variable mm -hmm. name, uh, go ahead and type V, your variable name, and that will actually print out the, the memory itself, not introspecting anything at all. It'll just scan the memory and print that out uh, in terms of like what properties that type has. Uh, mm -hmm. And that has been so much more successful for me. Um, so I encourage everyone to give that a try. That's great to know. I didn't even know about that. Yeah, so there are a few debugger commands. I guess we can go through a few of them. Uh, there's p and po. Po is print object. It will basically call description on your variable. Mm -hmm. um, and p is short for expression, because that makes sense. Um, <laughs> and that lets you basically type any code you want, including defining new variables. Uh, something I really like to do is type uh, p and then print, and then like a regular print statement, um, because that will then go ahead and print to the console instead of do Xcode's weird like debugger um, entry in the console. So it's a little easier to see sometimes. Sometimes um, it's very annoying, like dictionaries <laughs> and, and the like. Yeah. I don't know. I really like Objective-C dictionaries, at least uh, on the console, because Swift dictionaries are hit or miss. Sometimes they're easy to read, but most of the time they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Objective-C ones just print out as plists, ASCII plists, which is yep. super convenient. Uh, so uh, one super common debugging technique that I think we all start off with, right, uh, is print debugging. Um, mm -hmm, yeah. And that is a, a very quick way to kind of get a handle as to what is going on, especially when you're just starting to write the code um, and you don't really have anything else. Um, and uh, there are different things that we could do. Like when we're print debugging, we can use print, obviously. We can use NSLog. Um, so there's a few variations there. One of my personal favorite things to do is to pick an emoji uh, for what I'm working on and to use that emoji uh, in front of my print statements. And then when I'm running my code to filter by that emoji, which means that I'm only going to get print lines that match that, um, that emoji, which keeps things super clean because ever since the beginning of Xcode, Apple has always also printed stuff to the console. Um, which can be either super useful or not useful at all, uh, depending on which variation of Xcode you're using. Um, so I really like that technique of being able to quickly filter down what is uh, printed out by exactly what I want. Uh, and when I'm too lazy to type an emoji, I usually just like equals, 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 five equals. That's my, that's what I'm using in this class. And then if I forget to remove all those and I'm in another class, Z, 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 something super obnoxious that is going to be super easy to find. Um, and that also usually helps. I think your your emoji trick is really cool. They like I just try and find a unique string like this class or this process is doing that or whatever. I'm definitely mm -hmm. using emojis now. It's so that makes it nice. so colorful. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. There's like this visual delineation between the lines rather than you having to like search and read the text. You're like, oh, it's a stop sign emoji. Sweet. I can I can you know easily see this when I'm scrolling through a thousand lines in the console or whatever. That's cool. You know, um, now, now that you said like the, that visual um, like cue with emojis, I think that's really powerful. I remember Brent Simmons, uh, a really fantastic Mac, Mac developer, just 
casually mentioning on Twitter that that it would be interesting. I don't remember if, if it was a blog post or a tweet mentioning like, hey, wouldn't it be interesting if we, we added like sounds to our functions? Uh, and so that way, when you are debugging the the program itself, you can hear the execution, right? And it's, I think, I never tried it, but I can definitely see how you could see like a function being called too many times or not being called immediately without even having to do anything because the sound of the, of the program has changed somehow. Uh, I just, that, it triggered, uh, the memory was triggered because of the visual thing, uh, which I agree is a great idea. So if you're on the Mac, you can use NSBeep, which is the sound version of print. Um, and that will just beep at you. And that's, I, I would say that's probably the, the oldest debugging like trick that has ever existed is to print a bell character on your console, right? Um, just yeah, that's just, like, true. Like spam the user that something went wrong. Um, so you can you can go ahead and use that in your own in your own functions as well. NS beep will just go beep, uh, depending on what what you configure your beep to do. Uh, but that's a great segue into um, breakpoint actions because you can actually do that on a particular breakpoint. Um, instead of having the breakpoint pause your code, you can have it go ahead and play a sound, run an action. Um, and that would do exactly what you want, Fernando, and so, make your make your method really obnoxious. I, <laughs> what what I, I think I don't know if this is uh, I think this is Brent's idea. I'll just say it's Brent's idea, even if it isn't. Sorry, Brent. Um, but I was thinking of like adding uh, sound to every function, like different tones. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that you could get like the orchestra, and during launch time, you'd be like hearing all these functions and i guess after a while you'd probably be like wait a minute that didn't sound right like that wasn't what i was expecting the i don't know it's kind of fun are, the harmonics can be computed from a hash of the function uh that'd be that'd whatever. be really cool that and then someone sweet. renames your function you're like something is wrong yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, but, but wouldn't that be cool right like someone refactored your code and you don't even go to the code review you just run the code first to test it and you're like this isn't right. Like, what did you do? And I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> We're humans in the end. So any anything that helps you debug um, using your senses is, is a, a good thing in my book. Yeah, I think that's a huge thing is whatever does help you. Um, I think, like Dimitri said, if you're starting out, a lot of printing is fine. And I'll use a lot of printing uh, and NS logging to start with. Um, I've really only done a couple like semi large ish, uh, not really large, but semi like user facing features in LumaFusion at this point. But uh, it went through many iterations from very, very dirty. Let's get this working to, uh, you know, cleaning it up. And I'm I'm absolutely sure that in that uh, in those first iterations, I really only did have like some print statements or some breakpoints and it wasn't great on error handling and debugging uh you know potential issues and then as it kind of went through both uh the qa process of kind of coming back and, and finding bugs and or um just you know me actually cleaning it up for sort of a final pr then you know kind of implementing some more um i guess preventative uh debugging uh, steps like you know adding better logging or whatever you have um dimitri i think i think you were going to mention um uh breakpoint actions is that right yeah so uh breakpoint actions are a great way of adding sounds is how i brought them up um, oh right and they they are also a great way of doing stuff as opposed to stopping your code like breakpoints as right, we all yeah. know them you can stop your code right um but you can also attach actions to them to do uh, other yep. things at the same time. And we also have the, um, I, I don't know if you'd consider this a breakpoint action, but we have the um, like the little breakpoint toolbar when you're on a breakpoint where you can do things like Dimitri was talking about earlier, where you can, you know, you, you're paused on a line of code, but then as you're stepping through, uh, as you want to go line by line on kind of, kind of a human level, you can step through uh, line by line, like Dimitri said. Sometimes it kicks you out of out of the <laughs> the pausing, but you can, um, and you can also like step into functions. That, you know, you're on a line that's like uh, another class's function. You can step into that, step out of functions, and that is a really good way of 
following where the code can go as opposed to um, having to, you know, command click and say jump to definition on mm -hmm. function after function, you can just kind of breakpoint and let itself run and sometimes and you'll run through the control flow of whatever uh, situation you're going in. And that may be, you know, going to a different part of the function or a different function entirely uh, based on whatever's happening. So that can be really nice to follow it at sort of a human understandable level of speed. And was it Hansel and Gretel that left the breadcrumbs as they as they went through the forest? Um, yeah. So something I like to do, because Swift drives me nuts as it uh, leaves, so as I'm stepping through, I usually leave uh, breakpoint breadcrumbs um, as I kind of dig into my method. Um, and I usually end up with like hundreds of breakpoints this way mm -hmm. uh, as I'm like trying to go deeper and deeper every single time. But that is a very useful technique um, when you're trying to do something that you can repeat a ton of times, but you, it's like really complicated what is exactly going on. You can go ahead and leave breakpoint breadcrumbs along the way um, and that allows you to get rid of the previous ones and more quickly jump to exactly where you start to think the issue is uh, actually happening. And then you can inspect it further in different scenarios uh, and things like that. Yeah. Um, as, as like kind of an aside here, uh, we were talking a few days ago about how uh, the the swipe to go back to a, a previous page in Xcode is basically broken and <sighs> I don't know, Xcode 11 or something. It's been a long time. Um, Dimitri led us on to uh, control command and the arrow keys to go back and forth and it will actually take you back to the previous pages. And so that uh, I've been, I was using that for maybe a week or two uh, since Dimitri's let me know about it. And it's been, it, it's sped me up significantly when you are going through that trail of breadcrumbs and maybe you're like, oh shoot, I need to go back instead of swiping back in it losing your place in the page it kicks you to to the actual right place so uh just what you need anyone. when you're concentrating and you're like have a, like a, yeah. all your memory is like keeping variables in your mind and you're like very concentrated and then you swipe back and you're like where am i and then what was i doing yeah. <laughs> what was i trying to check you see exactly. you're, you're fighting the other cop like we're meant to what are you doing stop we need to get those guys and they're tripping you up. Oh my god, it's so frustrating. Xcode was the perpetrator all along. Yeah, yeah, an inside agent, I guess. Uh. Uh. Anyway, don't don't. Uh, you you really need to have like good breakpoint hygiene. I tell that to uh, to my students all the time. Like if, once you stop using a breakpoint, just get rid of it, because otherwise you're like just stopping and continuing, stopping and continuing like For hundreds sure. of times. Yeah. Not to mention um, when you merge new code in, the breakpoints get out of sync. Um, so they end up somewhere completely oh. different sometimes. Yep. Um, and if you leave them in, stuff is just going to start pausing. And you're going to be like, why is this pausing here? Um, <laughs> like oh, oh, one one of my, my most hated things about breakpoints currently uh, is when you set a breakpoint on a method that also has a closure, uh, that breakpoint will trigger for both of those uh, lines of code, one for the method being triggered and then one for the closure being triggered. And sometimes you'd want one or the other, but not both. Um, and something really neat coming to Xcode 13 is column breakpoints, which basically means you can set the breakpoint at a specific method that's being called within the line. So you're no longer constrained to like an entire line of code with its five method calls one after the other. Uh, you can go ahead and say, I only want the breakpoint to trigger on this method um, that's seven words in, uh, for instance, oh, and I didn't it know won't, that. that's it cool. won't need to go through, um, and kind of run through all of them one after the other. And then Xcode forgets that you're doing breakpoints and says, Oh, the program's running. Um, especially so, <laughs> if it's like a map or a flat map or something. And yes, exactly. That they, they, the, um, demo was something like that mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, you don't it? need to. Cool. Yeah. Uh, but wait, now you've got me thinking, Dimitri, what if I have like a column breakpoint and then I merge code? I think it's symbolic in how it like keeps track of it, um, but it so will then... probably mess up just the same. Uh, so <laughs> don't worry. Don't you worry, Fernando. It won't be useful. <laughs> it'll find. <laughs> it'll find ways. The dumb cop is still dumb. Yeah. Oh my god. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else? What else do we have? Um, something really cool that you can also do with breakpoint actions. It turns out they're super 
super powerful, um, is you can write new code with it. Uh, so something I like to do is uh, as I'm inspecting something, I will go ahead and set a breakpoint action um, right where I want to insert new code. Uh, and then you can do a debugger command, type P, and then any code you type there will be run in line with your breakpoint. And you can also check the continue after um, continue after something, whatever it's called, uh, automatically continue. And mm -hmm. that breakpoint won't stop anymore. It'll just go ahead and run whatever command that you specify. Um, you can make a sound at the same time. Uh, and it will inject code into your running process. So that way you don't need to tear down everything that you've set up to kind of get the code going um, or the bug uh, expressing itself, you can go ahead and add extra lines of code. You can try to fix it and see, oh, does this make things better? It's especially useful when you're uh, setting up um, views and stuff in UIKit and you want to like m nudge something over a little bit to the right or to the left, you can go ahead and add these extra lines of code. Um, and every time the view gets created, it will go ahead and run those at the same time. So that way you can you can concentrate on fixing that, and then afterwards you can write the code that kind of tidies everything up. Yeah, and another good thing with that is because it's in a breakpoint, if it's if it doesn't work, it's in the breakpoint. As soon as you remove the breakpoint, it's gone, and you never had to like go through your code, comb through it, and you know pull things out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Xcode used to have a feature. I don't remember what it was called. I think it's fix it. Uh, but that's uh, that's something else now. Uh, but it was a little tape icon, and it allowed you to do exactly this, where you can kind of inject code, but code that you typed in the editor. So you'd type some code in the editor, you'd click that button, and then your running app would just magically have that extra code. Um, and that was part of GDB, but it's no longer part of LLDB, which is a big shame because that was, although super crashy, uh, it was a useful uh, technique every now and then to add some extra functionality while your app was running um, that we can't we can't do as easily nowadays, but breakpoint actions do allow us uh, to get something close. I'm going to start using them a lot. I, I didn't, uh, I actually, I knew that we had actions, but I've honestly, I can't think of like a really good use case right now, but the fact that I now know that I should probably be using them, um, I'm sure I'm going to find a few cases where it's going to be really useful. Yeah, if anything, just printing like variables exactly. um, yeah. that you didn't know you needed to track and you don't want to reset everything up, that's where they're super useful. You yeah, know, the sense. the example I can think of off the top of my head that happened to me like a week ago was um, I was in some sort of loop and I was looking for an object with a specific ID. And so I just made the action say, uh, you know, only only break when it's this id uh, that, right yeah that's and good. so it's running through this loop but i'm not having to hit continue playing until it gets to that point something like that is really nice yeah you can attach conditions and it auto completes mm -hmm. so um if you've never yep. realized that xcode had this functionality you can double click a breakpoint and then this little pop-up comes up and you can customize all this i didn't know you could double click i always command clicked you can oh. right click too and say edit breakpoint there's I no did not know right you could do click. either of those. <laughs> <laughs> two finger click. Yes, two. If finger you're click. using a trackpad. Yes. Secondary oh, you, click. Do you literally mean like right click if you're using a magic mouse? Um, I don't know. I like always use a trackpad. Of... I I just always. I think I it's a Windows can... term. A right click on the mouse because there would be two yeah. buttons. Yeah. Is past. it? I just... Is it still? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think so. I always use a it's trackpad, a, even at my desktop. So I just, I f think of a two finger click as a right click. I think that's the, ter that's the terminology. I agree. I, I didn't think it was, but I think it is. Uh, there's a Mac OS user guide that says right click on Mac. And it says control click is similar to right click, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So definitely, definitely. I can now say right click. I've been avoiding it for so long. <laughs> Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> Hey, that's what this podcast is all about. We're here to solve things. Nice. <laughs> Not to mention on uh, Mac OS Coco, uh, it's right mouse down. Uh, so <laughs> there, there's there's the de facto API that Let's translates to the Let's not go to, to the, the dark finger. lens, Dimitri. <laughs> AppKit is not. <laughs> so did you, I, I have a very important question. Dimitri, mm -hmm. do, you used to double click your breakpoints. Well, do, I, I guess you still do, right? Mm-hmm. So if you single click 
double finger, did you save a click or did you not save a click? If you double click, <laughs> well, you'd have to click again on edit breakpoint. So, yeah, good point. Oh, now my I have god. doubts. Wait. Oh my god, that's actually yeah, it is a double click. Okay, I start to have doubts whether that was the right thing. So the efficient, if you want to get to the actions, is double click because you save yeah, yourself. Yeah, it turns the breakpoint off, but click. it turns it back on, yeah. and then you have the little command. Brilliant. Dimitri, the ten x developer, right there. <laughs> <laughs> It reminds me of the half a press. Have you guys seen that video? Oh my God. Am I going to blow your minds? We need first. We need to know about parallel universes. <laughs> we can't, we, I'm going to link it. You can link it in the, um, in the description. It's just like a, a 20 minute video. I'm sure you guys have seen it. Uh, it never mind. It's about super Mario 64 and speed running. So probably not tangentially related. I would say programming excellent <laughs> <laughs> so uh breakpoints and uh prints uh to get back on topic uh they're great for debugging but horrible for performance um yep. if you put uh if you put a print statement or a breakpoint as a matter of fact even if that breakpoint doesn't get called um or doesn't stop it adds a ton of lag to any loop um so they're not great in that context and there's another technology um that uh, Apple came out with a few years ago, and those are OS signposts. And what they do is they ha they're they very lightweight uh, signifier, mm. uh, and they collect information such that uh, when you run your app in instruments, you can go ahead and build up uh, graphs that will show you when something starts and when th something overlaps with it and when something stops, how often something gets triggered. Um, and you'll see all this visually in instruments, um, and that's another great way of uh, introspecting what your code is actually doing um, because it can give you a visual way of like seeing exactly what's going on there. These hang posts, are they like always log? Uh, same yeah, thing? It's part of the same framework, yeah. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I've, I've, used, I've used them sparingly and I think some popular framework, uh, logging frameworks use them, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think Coco Lumberjack does... Uh, uh, I think that's the only one that I've used that's decent. And it's especially useful if you've used NSLog like me to kind of compare two time signatures as a lazy, uh, lazy <laughs> person's um, uh, benchmark. Uh, so something you can do is you can log A and then log B after something has been done. Uh, and you, all you have to do is look at the logs afterwards and subtract the two numbers. Uh, and it tells you how long something took. Uh, if you use signposts, you can actually start and stop a signpost, and that will give you a much more exact uh, measurement in terms of time, um, and that's much more accurate uh, long term. Uh, so please go ahead and use that, and not analog <laughs> like I do. That's a really important, uh, really important lesson, and I have an anecdote that's kind of funny uh, to go with it. During my very first um, iOS interview, I mm -hmm. think probably 2010. Uh, they asked me to draw a fractal on an iPhone. So I would do you basically drawing directly in a CG context and just depending on the amount of zoom, you would redraw the fractal again and again, right? Because for those of you that don't know, a fractal is a mathematical um, function that has infinite... Ah, I forgot the word. English is so hard. Density. Um, how do you? No. How do you call it when when you're like, like, sharp when when you're looking at something and it's sharp, infinite detail, infinite resolution. Yeah. Well, I think that's good enough. So uh, a, a a fractal has infinite resolution because it doesn't matter how much you zoom into it. Um, it's always going to be redrawing the pixels according to the formula, and so it'll look sharp regardless of how much you right. zoom into it. And some fractals even have like a repeating pattern. So like uh, Mandelbrot, which is one of the most famous, you, you see the, the little square with the, the, the little circle with the smaller circles in the, um, on the sides. And if you keep scrolling, you'll end up at the same point, even if you're like a hundred zooms. Anyway, uh, the point of this is that I had everything implemented within the time frame, except that it was really slow. Like, like zooming in was really, really slow and I just couldn't figure out why. 
I thought like everything was working well, blah, blah, blah. I ran out of time and I sent the, um, uh, I sent the, the, the test, the take home test. They said, Hey, this is really good code, blah, blah. They extended an offer. So I was very happy with it. But like the next day, uh, it just finally dawned on me. And maybe we, this should be the next topic about like debugging when you can't debug, you have to wait. Um, I was like, it's the logs. I removed the oh. NS logs and it was blazing fast. I was just printing out so much into the console that it was very, very slow. So yeah, there there is a cost to having your uh, prints, logs, or whatever. That's why Apple came up with the uh, framework Dimitri mentioned. So food for thought. And I don't know about Swift's print statements, but NS logs are not thread safe in the sense that if you print from two different threads, they will overwrite each other and you'll get like a gobbledygook log message, which is always fun to try to use <laughs> when debugging uh, because you have half a message from one thing and then all of a sudden it restarts and you have a message from something else, same line, uh, not even a new line. Uh, so uh, that really makes makes a mess of everything. So try not to uh, debug with log statements. Uh, they are useful when you're starting out. Um, they are useful for small little things when you, that you need to get done quickly, uh, but they are not a useful like long-term solution to anything. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Not to mention, uh, prints don't get saved anywhere in production code. Um, and NS logs, uh, it, there's, it's not practical to get them off of a user's device. Um, so it's, they're not useful in that uh, sense either. Um, so unless you're logging to a file and you are taking care of that file, it's not going to reach two terabytes in size and cause your user's computers to crash, uh, then... Uh, <laughs> then you can go ahead and use logs so that way you can have a record of what sequence of events happened, uh, especially when you know something bad is happening and you need help kind of debugging it. Uh, you can add log statements and save those log statements to file. Just be very careful about that file uh, and make sure that uh, it isn't it isn't just accumulating sensitive data or it isn't accumulating data without end um, when you're doing so. I think every every backend developer has run into their server stops working because the log files consume the entire hard disk. Like that is just <laughs> a thing that happens with backend development uh, that we don't think about on iOS development because uh, when we print or uh, NS log, that goes to the system log, which is taken care of. Like that one is uh, kept tidy and uh, is purged uh, almost, I would say almost daily. Um, so. We don't think about like overdoing that, but if you ever do save your own logs, your own file, uh, be very careful about uh, keeping information around for just as long as you need it, basically, because log files can get big and can uh, consume everything on an SSD, which is not that great. Not great. I miss I miss Objective C. Some of the its quirks just grew on me so much. <laughs> Anyway, well, Dimitri, unless you have like another topic, I have a nice segue. Go for it. Okay. To the, to the uh, like, it's really important. Like these tools are fundamental to understanding what's going on with code. But sometimes, like like what happened in my anecdote, sometimes you just got to step away from the computer. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you, you're just trying to make sense of things and it's just not going to happen. Stop trying to make it happen. Uh stepping away and just letting that problem go into your subconscious and in the back burner, uh, that's, uh, that's a very valid advice, not only for debugging, but programming itself. It hasn't happened very often to me, but, um, a couple of weeks ago I was working on an issue and I couldn't figure it out. And then that night when I was going to sleep, it was, it like came to me what probably I could do to try to fix it. And I was like, I've heard of this, but it's never happened to me. This is insane. <laughs> like your brain just like keeps working on stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's the Tetris not to phenomenon. say that always happens. What's it's that? A, it's a Tetris phenomenon. So they did a study of a bunch of people playing Tetris right before they went to bed. Um, and those same people, they dreamed of playing Tetris. Um, and the next day they were significantly better at Tetris, uh, because oh, um, they basically mm -hmm. spent all night thinking about Tetris uh, without realizing it, like subconsciously. Uh, so That's cool. if, if something is cons like, as Fernando said, if you can't figure something out, do take a break. Uh, and preferably if that break is when you go to sleep, then your brain will be actively working on your problem yep. without you realizing it. Um, and 
you might not come to the solution in the morning, but when you think about that problem again, it's gonna be significantly easier for you to kind of figure it out. This only works if you spend a significant amount of time being troubled by your problem. So if you look at something, <laughs> you're like, I don't get this, and then move on and then hope that it's gonna to come to you. It ain't coming to you. Uh, but if you do spend a lot of time like racking your brain on trying to figure something out and then take some time away, uh, it does it does get easier to figure it out after some time off um, because you had time to to recompartmentalize everything. Yeah, got to drive it deep into the psyche. That's actually perfect that you said that because I try and abuse that technique as much as possible. And I have noticed like for many, many years that I'm like debugging something 10, 15 minutes. Then I get to the hard part. And I'm like, uh, maybe it'll come to me later. And then I just go and watch a YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> and then happen. I come back and it's like, nope, I really have to like put in the work. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, it's very, I don't know. It's funny. I, I just realized I do that when you said it. A, a sister phenomenon to all this, I would say, is the rubber ducky phenomenon where you yep. take the time to explain your problem to someone else. And by the time you're done explaining it, it just comes to you. Um, and you realize, oh, that I didn't think of this. And then you go and try that and it works. Uh, sometimes just like organizing your own thoughts on an issue can really help you um, help you think about the problem in a different point of view. And I think that's what the rubber ducky phenomenon is. But yeah, uh, it might be something completely different. I don't know. <laughs> it's like it's no, also I agree. called bike I... shedding, I think. Or it might be, that bike shedding might be something different. I don't know. I've heard of it as rubber ducking or yeah. And I think it really is a, for me, I have to think about a problem differently when I'm trying to explain it and verbalize it. Even yeah. if mm -hmm. I'm talking to like my phone or, you know, whatever, it doesn't have to be a person, talk to your cat, whatever you want, but you have to think about things in a different way in order to verbalize it where maybe in your mind you're going from like a to d to b to c to whatever but you kind of have to go sequentially or, or whatever it is uh when you're verbalizing it and so i i agree as a cat owner i, I cannot recommend sense. talking to your cat to solve uh code oh. problems because immediately you just go who so who's so cute who likes praying oh yes yeah, <laughs> and that's all you start talking about and then nothing about the code and you didn't solve anything it was just a waste so it's not just a waste me. of time <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so your cat is my YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> and I was going to say that, Spencer, that it, it's exactly like you said. If if anyone's ever written a Stack Overflow question that was never submitted, that's the same effect. You're like stuck on something, stuck on something. All right, you know what? I'm going to go to Stack Overflow. You start writing the question and then you're like, oh, I didn't think of that. And then you go and try it. If you can fix it, that's great. If not, you come back, keep writing. And then, oh, I didn't think of that. And then like putting it out there via like either verbally, uh, like spoken or in written form really does change your perspective and helps out a ton. And, and if you are ever asking for help, do not go from it from the point of view of, uh, I tried everything and I don't think this is possible because if you do, that's going to come <laughs> out in your words and every, no one else is going to want to necessarily help you figure that out because it n not necessarily intentionally. They're just going to be like, well, they, they seem to think it's impossible and uh, it probably is. Um, so be careful when you're asking for help to not like emit that kind of energy uh, because it does it does limit uh, others is ability to help you solve your problem. Um, so do keep that in mind. Yeah. I think we all saw that as instructors at Lambda, where you would have the student that would say, I need help. I, you know, this is impossible or I need help. You know, it's not working as opposed to the person that would ask, you know, an, a question and say, this is what I've tried. Um, I'm not, you know, quite sure where to go, but these are the steps that I've done. And I don't know, you know, maybe, a, maybe some of them started doing that. And like Fernando did with his stack overflow questions, maybe they solved it or they asked the question, <laughs> but at least someone could, uh, get on the right train of thought to try to help them at the very, very least. I don't have a ton of stack overflow questions. I, I only have a few, uh, but one of them was driving me insane. It was about, um, archiving. I was trying to archive a build 
for weeks and it just wouldn't archive and I couldn't understand why until like like after the second week I was like all right you know what I'm delaying this way too much um, I just need help I wrote the the uh, the Stack Overflow question uh, let me see if I can find it but I was like shocked and maybe I shouldn't have shouldn't have been shocked uh, it says Xcode Xcode's build and archive is not working this is <laughs> this is Xcode 3 so it's been a while uh, but it was basically some guy just saying, oh, yeah, just go into your uh, project and check generate debug symbols. And I'm like, I was never, ever going to go into my Xcode project, find generate debug symbols and turn it on. It's like sometimes I, that, I guess this is a good uh, segue into another topic. Sometimes it doesn't matter how much you want it. Like some bugs are not meant to be fixed by... Uh, skill alone it has to be experienced like it doesn't matter how smart you are sometimes someone will go and say oh yeah i've been there just do this and you're like but how did you know because i was taught by my father and his father before him and so on back in know. xcode 2 yeah. <laughs> yeah thanks to all the boomers out there <laughs> yeah Oh, that, yeah, to, to just wrap that up, I offered a 50-point bounty, and I was very happy to give it away nice. for that. I don't even have 50 points. What, you I don't? don't? Neither. I, I have no idea how many points I have on Stack Overflow. Great, let's, let's measure our worth by Stack Overflow points then. Ah, uh, perfect. Okay, we'll, we'll measure <laughs> later, okay, Fernando? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. So on that wonderful segue... Uh, today's episode is brought to you by Weekly Swift Exercises. Learning Swift, there's no substitute for practicing. There's dozens, literally dozens, of people that Fernando's mentored through different programs, and he's seen it time and time again. After you learn the basics of programming, you slow down because learning through experience is demanding and painful. Increasing your confidence is key, and there's an easy way to do it. Practice. Fernando's weekly exercises help you practice concepts like closures and protocols while implementing actual features like dark mode. It's free to join. Besides the exercises, Fernando sends one or two articles about learning Swift. Some are technical in nature, but most of them will help you in your career by teaching you things like best practices, working as a team, and getting ready for your first job. Thanks again to Fernando and From Junior to Senior for sponsoring Code Completion. Go to twitter.com slash from junior to senior. That's F-R-O-M-J-R-T-O-S-R today to learn more and subscribe to that mailing list. Wait, can I clap? You're allowed mm. to clap. <laughs> I, I wrote the uh, literally dozens just because I wanted you to, uh, to say it out loud. There are dozens of us. Literally I could have said dozens. hundreds. <laughs> no, I'm fine with dozens. <laughs> You're fine with dozens? Not too many, please. <laughs> now that we've gone through our topics, it's time for Complete the Code, where we quiz our listeners on your knowledge of Swift, Apple, and all things development. Spencer? Yep. Uh, all right. So uh, we have a winner from last week who is Michael Reddig. Uh, to summarize, Michael tentatively suggests either uh, URLs, uh, check resources reachable, or just accessing the file directly, both of which are the answers we were looking for. Um, to expand on that, if you're even unsure if a URL exists or not before opening it, you should just go ahead and open it, as checking first will duplicate the amount of work the file system needs to perform anyway. Uh, if, however, the existence of the file is all you need to verify and you don't need to open it, uh, using URLs check resource is reachable will work for pretty much all URLs uh, and is recommended over getting a file system path and then checking uh, with the file manager if the file is there. Uh, this week we have a Swifty complete the code for you. Uh, if you're listening to podcasts, please check the podcast art or the show notes to follow along. Uh, we have a uh, chain of operators on an array of items. The first maps each entry to the items path. Next, we filter by the prefix uh, forward slash documents, followed by a compact map taking the last path component of each item, followed by finally the prefix of the results limited to a certain number of max entries, uh, and then saving the results in a variable. Uh, assuming these steps need to be performed in the order they're presented, how would you improve this code? 
So can you complete the code? Tweet your answers to us with hashtag complete the code, all one word. The first to get it right will get a shout out on next week's show. By the way, Michael, who, who solved uh, last week's, he is a really good developer. And he no, was no also our guest he... last week. Yeah, yep. I know. Or I wanted to be here. Week. Yeah. With all that out of the way, it's time for Compiler Error, a segment where I get to test my fellow completionist knowledge about Swift, Apple, and all things development. And today we have a theme, and it is all about error reporting. So error reporting and handling is a great way of uh, making sure to uh, have a way of debugging your code, especially when an error gets sent. And many, many apps just don't have errors at all, which uh, is... Uh, frustrating as a developer because then you can't fix anything. Uh, so do add error reporting to your own code and hopefully uh, this compiler error will help you know what features are available to you in terms of error handling. So statement number one, NS error supports built-in error recovery through the use of recovery attempter, allowing the origin of the error a chance to handle things like retries when delivered to an NS alert. Statement number two, a custom Swift error type can provide localized description information by conforming to localized error and overriding localized description. Error, uh, statement number three. Although it isn't possible to specify the type of error thrown from a method in Swift, it is possible to restrict the error type when it is delivered within a result. And statement number four. It is possible to omit localized descriptions and failure reasons when creating an NS error while still making this information available to consumers of the error by creating a user info provider for the error domain. So, uh, Fernando, you went last last time, so you're going first this time. Aha, it's number three because Dimitri said error. Oh, I'm sorry, statement number three. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your final no. answer? <laughs> yeah. No, no. That is not sound logic. I will, I will, I will reveal that much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. I, I, I think this is this is this is one of your easier ones. I don't know if I'm gonna eat my own words, but let's add a little bit of drama and hype to it. I think this Ooh. is one of your easier ones. Um, I'm gonna skip number one because that's the one I think it's it's a, uh, uh, it's is not right. Um, a custom Swift error type can provide localized description information by conforming to localized error and overriding localized description. I don't know if, well, I, so localized error, as far as I can tell, is a protocol. So I don't know if you'd be exactly overriding localized description, but that does make sense. Um, uh, you can conform to localized error and provide a localized description. Um, on number three, uh, it is you. Are, it is impossible to specify the type of an error thrown. God, I hate Swift for that. Uh, I would love, love, love if I could say throw an enum. That would make it like brilliant. I, I honestly, I'm ignorant enough that I have no idea why they haven't do it. It's probably like a really difficult issue to solve in the compiler. It would just make the language so much better. Um, uh, but it is definitely possible to restrict the error type when it is delivered within a result because result expects an error and in Swift an error is a protocol. Um, and finally, number four, it is possible to omit localized descriptions and failure reasons when creating an NS error. This is all true because you can have, well, I don't, that's actually, that's actually an interesting point. I don't know if the user description dictionary can be, I guess you could be sneaky and pass along a mutable NS dictionary to user info and then change the key later on. But that doesn't sound completely right. I don't know. Uh-huh. And then number one, I think you can retry an error, but I don't know. I hate AppKit, so I don't know I don't know enough about it. I don't know if NS alert is actually <laughs> Dimitri's laughing. Why are you no you're evil? <laughs> Your hair uh, is slowly getting crazier and crazier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, damn. I think user info is not read only, but I don't know. I know it's not two and three. I see the one or four. I'm going to go with number one. That was my initial gut reaction. An excellent choice. Spencer? Yeah, I'm going to... 
Hmm, yeah, okay. One, I don't know. No clue. Um, two kind of struck out to me because um, as far as I know, the only thing that the error protocol includes is already a localized description. So I don't think you need to conform to localized error if that's even a thing. Uh, so I'm going to go with two. Uh, that's just kind of my gut feeling on this one. I, I don't know about the rest of them, to be honest. An equally excellent choice. Uh, so let's go over all of them. Uh, that That is your final choice? Yeah. No. Yeah. Dun, dun, okay. dun. Uh, so let's go over them in reverse order. Uh, so uh, there's nothing tricky going on here. So we're not putting immutable user info. Uh, we are simply not providing user info. You're creating an error with a domain and a code and it will magically have the user info we need when we deliver the error to whoever wants to display it, uh, hmm. true or false. That's basically what this question is asking. Uh, and it turns out it is true if you provide a user info provider, which is a special object that oh, you can register. Okay. And this is new as gotcha. of a few years ago, so I don't blame you if you don't know about it. Uh, but it basically allows you to uh, specify uh, user info, a user info dictionary dynamically when the error is being evaluated. So you don't have to do it at creation time. That said, I would go ahead and suggest this is a horrible idea because it basically means that you're using the same error code in more than one place. And that's the worst way to use errors because then you don't know what through the error. So if you are using NS error in your code and like not Swift code, Objective-C code, make sure every spot that uses an error has a unique code associated with it and therefore a unique text. Because when a user says, hey, I got this error, you don't want to be searching through 50 instances of things that are throwing that same error. You want to you want to dial in exactly to the line of code that threw it. Otherwise, it's not going to be super useful to you. Error messages are for you, the developer, not for the user, uh, for the most part. Uh, so I, I don't know if I agree. In my professional experience, uh, something went wrong. Please contact support is good enough. 99% of the time. <laughs> no, sorry, keep going to me. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, like, it's like Apple's error reporting. Crickets. There's yeah, no yeah. clue if something oh went God. wrong or not. <laughs> so, imagine I, being Apple. You, you have no idea what, went, what a user is complaining about. <laughs> Any number of things could have gone wrong. So oh. this one is true. So good job so far. Uh, statement number three, although it isn't possible to specify the type of error thrown uh, from a method in Swift, it is possible to restrict the error type when it is delivered through a result. Uh, both of you agree with this. And uh, I want to ask you, what happens if you're using async await with a result? Because then that result will turn into a try statement. And therefore, I don't know either, uh, but this is a true statement uh, as <laughs> oh far God. as I'm concerned. <laughs> Uh, I to. imagine if you do to throw, uh, if you do use async away, uh, then it will just be casted as an error, uh, and you won't have any type information left over. Um, the reason for this is actually a political one more than a technical one. They did start Im the implementation with typed errors, uh, but then they decided this is not the way to go uh, because uh, it turns out errors can come from all sorts of things, and they wanted to keep them. Uh, ambiguous like that i don't agree with that decision i usually make my own error types that wrap other errors if there's like an other error that occurred yeah exactly. just so that way i can use like a switch statement and and mm -hmm. do something useful with the error information but alas uh i don't agree and that's why i said it's a political decision more than anything because yeah. it very much depends on who was in charge when they decided to have it be that way i don't think there's like a right way or a wrong way per se no there is <laughs> no, big error handling man so that brings us to statement number two um now uh spencer as you as you brought up uh the error protocol does have a single um thing that's part of it and that's localized description now Are localized you sure? des description is not part of the error protocol it's a default uh implementation mm. uh as an extension uh now, this means that if you override localized description, if you return your error into anything that casts it as error the protocol, 
then Swift will not use your implementation and it will uh, go ahead and skip over it because it's going to use errors implementation. Um, this gets into the nitty gritty mm. of like Swift and protocols and uh, types and all that uh, because it's not a dynamic language. It's a statically, uh, it's a static language. So if you say error.localized description, it doesn't care what the actual type of error is. Uh, it's just going to use errors implementation of it. Uh, so that means that this is false, which means good job, Spencer. <laughs> you found the compiler. <laughs> we know. Uh, Finally. <laughs> now, there is a localized error protocol, uh, and that is an actual thing. But the thing you need yep. to override is error description, not localized oh. description. Uh, so if you override error description, then localized description will go ahead and call that on your implementation of it, uh, and you'll get the, the correct uh functionality so you were right for all the wrong reasons <laughs> congratulations <laughs> which is perfect for it. this episode <laughs> exactly right? yeah. we, we learned something um uh, wait wait Dimi. before you keep going yeah you said that localized description is a is it a protocol extension of of error yes so it's God, not I part of the main conformance they're the worst possible yeah, I, idea I, ever I remember like overhauling all the error handling in an app and I, I switched it all to localized description. And then we had a similar app uh, and that was like, we needed to do the same stuff too. Um, and um, we did all the same changes there. Uh, and we just assumed, oh, it's all good. We didn't like double check to see if the errors were actually throwing because we didn't like run into any errors during like normal usage. Uh, so we pushed that and then all of a sudden we weren't getting error, any error information that we thought we would be getting through localized description. It was just not being useful. So an error occurred, that something generic like that. And it turns out that was because we didn't override error description and we just override <laughs> localized description and yep. nothing was working as a result. Uh, so uh, I think the first time around we did not, uh, so we did not say that uh, our error type was a localized error and we did have error description. So it was like a mess in both directions. So if you have a custom error right. type, make sure it's a localized error and make sure you override error, uh, error description and you should be good. Um, I don't think I messed that up. So <laughs> good luck <laughs> um, uh, and good job, Spencer. Uh, and that means to say, sorry, Fernando, uh, you are wrong in that AppKit does in fact include uh, error recovery mechanisms uh, through a recovery attempter, uh, which if you present the error through uh, the um, controller hierarchy, it will eventually show up in an alert. Uh, you can control all the buttons of that alert in the error. You can control what the buttons do within that error. Uh, and that means you can do things like retries. You can go ahead and do something a slightly different way. You can pretty much do whatever you want um, in that uh, in those methods. So that's a super useful thing about NS error. And it turns out you can do this in Swift as well with a recoverable error. Um, so I found this out while I was um, researching this. That's a specialized uh, error sub protocol, whatever you want to call these things. Interesting. Um, and it allows you to to basically specify the same information. So uh, that's really cool. I don't know if it's used anywhere. Um, I know that localized error is seldomly used as is. Uh, so. Uh, be sure if you want to have a better time debugging your app when users complain, uh, implement good error handling uh, because it means that you can go ahead and find out when things go wrong. Um, and use unique error messages for every error. Like don't duplicate a single one and that's going to make your life super easy. Uh, so at I've a heard. previous job, we, we were using Marvel superheroes, which I don't know if you should because of copyright reasons. But every error had a very characteristic name, like it was Iron Man, Captain America, whatever. And it was really easy to to debug them most of the time. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So as always, I want to personally thank everyone for listening in this week. Be sure to follow us at Twitter on Twitter at Code Completion to know when new episodes get released and feel free to tweet at us if there's ever a topic you'd like for us to dig into. Most importantly, as a small podcast, please be sure to share this with your friends and family who are also interested in any part of the process of app development. It's your support that enables us to continue doing this and we hope to grow a healthy community around everything we discuss. Once again, I want to give my thanks to Spencer, who is at Spencer C. Curtis, that's S-P-E-N-C-E-R-C-C-U-R-T-I-S, on Twitter, 
and Fernando, who is at From Junior to Senior, that's F-R-O-M-J-R-T-O-S-R on Twitter, for joining me this week. My name, once again, is Dimitri. You can find me at Dimitri Buniol. That's D-I-M-I-T-R-I-B-O-U-N-I-O-L. And we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.